It is my pleasure to introduce to you the chair of the session, Professor Christopher Lowe. Professor Lowe was founding director of the Institute of Biotechnology here at the University of Cambridge and currently researches therapeutics and diagnostics in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology. He is a fellow in the Royal Academy of Engineering, Institute of Physics, and Royal Society of Chemistry. And having played key roles in spinning out 11 startup companies, he is well versed in enabling people in the field of biotechnology. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lowe. Thank you, Rebecca, for that uh, kind invitation. Well, this is all about leadership and the skills gap, but you'll notice on the podium here we have one gap already, one people gap, which is Dr. Adriana from Israel. Unfortunately, she's been ill and she cannot attend this session, so we're very sorry to hear that. But we have a wonderful panel, and actually probably the prettiest so far, I would say. <laughs> so anyway, let me start by just making a few general comments before I introduce the panel. And I want to just, just start by why is leadership important to start with? And I, I recall a recent report by the Association of Graduate Recruiters, and this was entitled Skills for Graduates in the 21st Century. And they listed top 10 uh, skill shortages amongst the graduates as, as a percentage of the employees that responded to that. The first one was commercial awareness. 67% of respondents said that was a critical issue. The second one was communication skills, 64%. The third one was leadership. So third of the ten, top 10 requirements for graduates, 33% of responders. And then if you want the rest of the list, it's ability to work in a team, problem solving, conceptual ability, subject knowledge and competence, foreign languages, numeracy, which is surprisingly only at nine, and a good general education. But number three is leadership. So the question is, what is leadership? Well, I have to say, I did go to Google to try and check out exactly what it actually meant. And, and Leadership is really concerned with people rather than concepts or fixed assets. It's all about a people-oriented behavioural approach. And good leadership involves serving the organisational group and the people within it. So it's that combination of the organisation and the people therein. And as it says, good leadership demands emotional strengths and behavioural characteristics which can draw deeply on a leader's mental and spiritual reserves. Now, we're in a divinity school, so we're looking for divine intervention, I think, in, from the audience at some stage. Now, I'm also surprised to find out that uh, when I looked into the academic lead, uh, literature about leadership, there were eight, at least eight major theories as to what leadership's all about. Now, that, is, that isn't typical academia, I don't know what is. But the eight theories, two of them refer to the genes. So what they're saying is great men, are in, it's in the genes, and therefore you can't really do much about it. So that, that's the first two of those. The uh, next two are actually referred to, well, they, they're called con contingent, contingency or situational theories. And it, what they're saying there is it's not just in the genes, it's what the person comes up against and how they deal with it. So that's the second issue, and particularly on a person basis. And then the other three, I, I won't bore you with all the names of these weird ideas, but they're all based on the relationship between the leader and the followers, the people that follow that leadership role. And so there's all those uh, hypothetical theories, and personally I think it's going to be a combination of all of those. And it depends on the situation, it depends on the genes, the traits, and a bunch of other parameters as well. And I'm sure my colleagues will come into this. The other thing I want to just draw a distinction between, because it comes up quite frequently, is the difference between leadership and management. And the answer is management is mostly about processes. It's quantitatable. It has measure ands, like, you know, how you use IT and all the other facilities uh, to affect a particular course of action. And leadership is about behaviour. So it's about the behaviour of people, and that's what makes a good, good, uh, good leader. And I, I just quote a few things. So it's quite interesting because the manager is the boss, if you like, and the leader then is the, uh, is the person that leads the enterprise. It says, the boss drives his men, the leader coaches them. And the boss depends on authority, the leader on goodwill. The boss inspires fear, the leader inspires enthusiasm. The boss says I, the leader we. Uh, the boss fixes the blame for the breakdown, the leader fixes the breakdown. Now, that's very true in my view. The boss says go, the leader say let's go, and the customer is always right, of course, at the end of it. So there are a number of qualities that are required to be a leader if you're in, in any sector at all. And I, I'm just going to quote one or two, which again are, are taken from the literature, and then I'm going to hand over to our uh, uh, distinguished panel. 
it says the first one is to be open to the best of everyone, everywhere uh, that has to offer. So you're choosing the best people anywhere in the world where they appear. Use initiative to act on opportunities. Get the right people in the right jobs. And I think we have an excellent panel here to prove that one point. Uh, make sure everyone counts and everyone knows they count. Uh, understand where the real value is added and put your best people there. Know when to meddle and when not to. That's also an important one. Display a can-do attitude rather than a can't-do attitude. And having worked in this university for 30 years, believe me, there are an awful lot in the latter character. <laughs> Uh, show enthusiasm, take ownership of problems, introduce improvements, and develop innovative practices and value innovative thinking. Again, learn new skills, and then, as it says on the last point here, which again, I would, uh, from my own experience, common sense is not common. And that's also <laughs> very true as well. So I want to just finish by just bringing up one other point. So we've dealt with uh, the concept of, uh, of a leadership. We've dealt with the concept of how it differs from being a manager. And the other thing is entrepreneurial leadership. Now, I know a number of students in this ex-students in this uh, lecture hall actually come from entrepreneurial courses. And I want to really throw it over to the panel at some stages. How do you judge whether someone is an entrepreneurial leader? What qualities would you look for in order to sort of meet the demands of the modern world? So with that last point, and one other point, of course we have a very attractive uh, um, panel here. I want to just bring up the question of females. How do they encourage females to get into the senior positions that you've got represented in front of you? So just to introduce the, the panel, on my left-hand side is Dr. Bahija Jalal, who's the CEO of Medimune in the UK, or UK, I think. No, US? US. US, well, same thing now, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Dr. Annalisa Jenkins, Head of Global R&D at Merck Serono, and on the far side, Adina Mangumat, the CEO of Spiral Genetics from, from the United States again. So, so over to you. All right, well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, really happy to, to be here. And it's so, so exciting to see the new generation, I feel old saying that, <laughs> that uh, uh, what you're doing is really fantastic. Uh, so what I thought maybe I'll just share with you for two minutes, five minutes, or something like that, where my journey, because it, it goes against the dogma that it's in your genes and it's in your, you have, if your mother is not like this, you cannot be or whatever, so which I hope you always challenge the dogma. So where I come from, you know, and, and how I look at really my career is, is determined, you know, are three things that determined my career. One is determination and why determination. So I come from Morocco. If I say that in the US, they're always like, where is it? They don't know, you guys know, right? <laughs> uh, so why determination is because, uh, you know, my mother never went to school. She actually had to uh, raise seven kids by herself. My father died really early. But she put the determination in on, on us that we're going to go and do whatever we, 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 we want to do. So it takes that. And it's that determination that I carried with me all the time. And I think the passion is definitely is science. Uh, and I, I am always sad when people ask me, so now that you don't do science, but you manage. That's the first mistake you make in your career if you think you have to make a choice between the two. Your first is always science, is never the managing or leading or something like that. Leading is definitely there. Managing, we manage resources. But so passion is, is definitely the science. And I followed that passion, um, went away from my family, and went to, did my schooling in Paris. And I'm, I'm going to say that because it's really important that you are the generation of you know, being mobile is very important and follow what, what you have to follow. So went to Paris, did all my schooling there, went to Max Planck Institute in, uh, in Germany uh, to do my postdoctoral studies and then before um, going to the US where I ultimately really found my passion which was more of the applied science and bringing medicines to patients. That definitely started there and since then you know, I've, I've been in several uh, companies, and one uh, now I ended up in, uh, in um, happily, uh, in, uh, in Medimune, which is the, I had the, the privilege to, of uh, um, leading the, bi the bio biolog biologics of AstraZeneca now for the last six or, or, or seven years. But along the way, I want to tell you, along the way, you know, definitely, if I want to characterize myself, I always followed my heart. That is why I went and never went back. Or Germany was 
because the, what I wanted to do was there, not because it was Germany or something like that. So this is really important if I if tell you my third thing is always follow your heart. And um, because we are scientists, what drives you, what gets you excited is what you do. And so don't settle, that's what I will say. You will have, will, I had along the way some successes like everybody else, but I had tons of challenges and tons of failures. But I can tell you, I learned a lot more from my challenges and my failures than I learned from my, my, uh, my successes. And I share with my, my group always the fact that the first company I worked with, we failed twice in uh, bringing uh, two compounds and we succeeded in the third one. So only in these two, I'm so glad I started my career by failing, not by succeeding, because I learned so much. And that's the learning I'm employing today. So you're gonna also, find along the way people who are gonna tell you what you cannot do, right? And that you cannot have it all. So I'm, I'm maybe talking to the women here. You can't have it all. Well, all I can tell you is you can, you know, as long as you put the determination, your passion, and you actually put the work into it as well. Somebody this morning said, uh, we are impatient. Um, I want you to be restless not impatient, because if you're gonna be in this business, you have to be patient. If you have a good idea, you have to pursue it, right? But you have to be restless. You, restless for me is you are in the business of innovation, never and never forget that. So be restless, that means never accept the dogmas, never accept what you know, has been done today. You have to reinvent the future, you're inventing the future. So I would love to have more discussion with you, so I'll <laughs> pass it to Annalisa. So thanks, Bhagija. And um, yes, great pleasure to be here for a couple of days to share with you this amazing forum. And as Bahija says, there's nothing better for us than to spend time with the next generation who are gonna carry forth science and innovation and improvement for patients. Um, I want to uh, tell you my story, and of course, it will just bring forward the themes that Bahija was just outlining around courage and resiliency. But also, what I always say to people is that life is a marathon, it's not a 100-meter dash. And so, again, although you, um, you don't really know where it's going to take you, and sometimes it's going to take the most amazing twists and turns, get comfortable with that, because I think your generation is going to be living in a time where there is no such thing as a job for life. And I'm going to describe to you a career which is really a life of jobs. And uh, I think that's going to be the future um, for our global talent pool. So I actually, as you can tell, was born here. Uh, neither of my parents went to college either, so I was first generation college. And I landed up at St. Bartholomew's Hospital Medical School when I was 17. And uh, by the time I was 19, I realized that although we didn't even have tuition fees then, I've been reading all about the tuition fees, not a good topic to go to, I don't suppose, but <laughs> anyway, we didn't have those. But I soon realized that, you know, as I was going to pursue my passion in medicine and healthcare, that my parents wouldn't have the resources. So, of course, I decided I had to make a slightly different choice. So I went down and joined the Navy. So um, I could talk a bit later about why I might have made that choice. But so I signed up um, to work for the British Navy. So my first job was 30 years ago. I was thinking about that, it's 30 years ago. So at 19, I became a surgeon sub-lieutenant. And I was the only woman in a, a class of 20. I was the 21st, and one of the first two women ever to be signed up to be in the medical branch of the British Navy. So I did that, and of course you had a return of service when you signed up. They paid for medical school, which was fantastic, and then you discover when you graduate you actually have a seven-year return of service. <laughs> um, and I won't bore you with all of the experiences, but I have to tell you, um, at your age, because that was really between the age of 29, uh, 19 and 29, I was actually in the military as a physician, doing general duties and then subsequently training in cardiovascular medicine. So in 91, I found myself 25 miles off the coast of Kuwait uh, on a ship with 700 men um, in the first uh, Gulf War, in, actually it was the second Gulf War, um, under fire. Um, again, that's a whole other hour's <laughs> lecture. Um, but I obviously learned a number of things uh, then. But what I did learn about, very young actually, as I look back, was about leadership and the power of leadership and many of the things that you were talking about actually. And I didn't realize I was learning it at the time, but I subsequently, as my career evolved, always went back 
to thinking about what I'd observed and learnt as a very baby medic uh, in the military. So I came to the end of my military career because I was given a choice. I was given the choice to be promoted to a surgeon commander, which sounded frightfully smart, to go off around the world on a global deployment. Um, unfortunately, at the time, I had two children who were three and one. And when I joined up to the Navy, they said, the one thing you have to know, Annalisa, is that A, you'll never go to sea, and B, if you have children, you'll have to leave. And, you know, dogmas. So there we were, seven years later. I'd been serving on a ship uh, in conflict in the northern part of the Gulf. Um, and I'd had two children. But, of course, the maternity leave and things hadn't rolled on in parallel <laughs> with the fact they'd let me have these children. So I said, no, I can't go off around the world, and I had to make a choice. So I left the military, actually, went into academia and the National Health Service and trained as a cardiologist, and then soon discovered that in the 90s that was not going to be my future. I was restless. I really didn't feel that becoming a cardiologist was my thing. So I joined the industry. And I joined the industry about 18 years ago. And at the time, everyone thought I was nuts. In fact, things like, uh, comments like, oh, you're going over to the dark side. Did you get that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think I got that for about 10 years. I still get that, actually. <laughs> you know. Why on earth would you work in the industry? Um, so that was um, in the mid-90s, and I joined a company. I, I went from being a research fellow at the National Heart and Lung Institute on the Brompton Road, looking at the molecular basis of statins, and I was considered a thought leader in those days. And Bristol Myers Squibb, that had a drug called Pravastatin, thought it was really clever that they managed to pull me away, and the next day I walked into an office in Hounslow as this baby medical advisor in cardiovascular medicine, having no idea what the job was, what it was going to lead me to. And then really in the last, uh, I spent 14 years at Bristol Myers. I went from London to Australia, where I ran Australia, New Zealand, and the Asia Pacific region. Two years later, I went to Princeton, New Jersey to lead the global or international medical affairs division for the company. Um, I went to Paris for a couple of years to be the Chief Medical Officer of Europe, Middle East and Africa. And then I went back to Princeton and I eventually was running a global medical division of the company. So a complete global deployment for the second time in my life. Multiple different roles. 14 years, I think seven roles at the company through all different parts of the business, both in R&D and medical affairs. And then finally decided that it was time to take on a new opportunity, and I moved back to Europe about two and a half years ago um, to my current company because I thought it would be really cool to go to a different part of the sector. So I decided to go from the large pharma into mid-cap European and um, have just spent an amazing sort of two and a half years in a very German uh, company uh, undertaking a major transformation of their R&D organization. And today is my last day at Merck Serono. So today, I have to be on message, <laughs> pre-approved, not quite, by my company. Tomorrow, if you get to see me on the panel, I'll be completely unplugged for the first time in, a, in many years. <laughs> and I can tell you what I really think uh, about the industry. Um, because I made a decision mm, a couple of months ago that it was time for a new career opportunity. And I'm going to be looking at a, at a new opportunity, which will start in about six months' time. Um, and I think that just highlights that, you know, life of jobs. Um, often people ask me, you know, did you ever expect, you know, when you joined the Navy at 19, that you'd be doing what you're doing now? And of course, 30 years later, no, of course not. But truly privileged by all the different experiences I've had. And the only other thing I would say is, um, I have two kids, they're 22 and 20. And I was saying to someone at the break that I wish my 22-year-old could ask such brilliant questions, <laughs> you know, as you were asking this morning. I'm sure he does. But they're both studying in the US. And if they were here today, they would say, yeah, it's been wild and wacky to follow mother around the world. And to have a mum that's sort of doing what she does, they wouldn't trade it. They wouldn't trade it. Because it gave them also an opportunity to have experiences that were really unique. So I think life of jobs, a marathon, be patient for doing things that really create energy and passion in you, but don't ever think that your next job's gonna be your final job. You know, see it as a continual evolution. And it is also a career, a professional career is one of lifelong learning. 
So that's the other thing, is that every job you do, I think, provides you with a unique op opportunity to gather a unique set of experiences that make you better and better as you move forward to take on new leadership responsibilities. Thank you. Very good. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Adina Mangabat, and I'm the CEO of Spiral Genetics. Um, my experience is going to be very, very geared toward the entrepreneurial side of things, because I started my own company when I was pretty young, 22. Um, so, out of the crowd, just show of hands, who among you are thinking about starting a company? Awesome. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the content, and a lot of the experience that I have is going to be really um, well geared for people that have questions about how do you do that. Um, but I can tell you a little bit about how that road happened, um, because the the starting of company seems to be uh, kind of a mysterious um, you know, endeavor. And so uh, I can provide a little bit of insight into that, but know that your path is also going to be totally different. Um, so my um, journey starts basically at the University of Washington. Uh, I was getting my undergrad in psychology of all things. So I'm not as well educated as most of you. Most of you are getting your master's or your PhDs. Um, and basically, in the middle of my senior year, I decided that I didn't actually want to go and get a PhD in psychology. But I'd worked with a number of startups while I was in college and decided that I really liked them. So I was interested in starting my own. So in my senior year, I took an entrepreneurship crash course, essentially. And uh, I met my first co-founder, Becky Dries, who's a molecular biologist PhD out of Berkeley that had been in the industry for a dozen years. Very, very smart, brilliant, like you guys. Um, and she and I got together and won a business plan competition. It was an idea for a genetic analysis company. Um, and the idea that we started with back then and the idea that we're implementing today, very, very different. Um, you know, back then it was something much closer to like 23andMe, so like, you know, consumer genetics oriented. And now what we do today is we basically make uh, high performance software for analyzing DNA for the medical uh, research community and the agriculture research community. So a little different. But um, you know, the path was uh, you know, very, very windy and uh, required a lot of uh, what they call pivoting. That's the, that's the term for changing your idea, because the first one isn't going to work. <laughs> um, and so uh, basically, over the next year, we found our third co-founder, Jeremy, who's our chief technology officer. And uh, basically, that was in 2009. And here I am today, and it's been, you know, quite the journey of raising money and building things and you know making making things that people actually want <laughs> hooray um, and um, you know I'm happy to speak to any of that experience but one of the things that I would say in terms of like the leadership side of things is um, you know leadership for me I, I needed to have something that was going to work for me in the long run. One of the things that I know is true about our generation is we tend to have a little bit of shiny object syndrome. And um, you know, the thing that really was important for me when I was building the company was really knowing myself well enough to know what was going to work for me in the long run. So what actually made me passionate, what really drove me. Um, and so I would say, you know, before you go and decide whether or not you're going to start a company or whether you're going to be, you know, the CEO or like whatever position you're going to be in, um, make sure that you know what actually drives you because that's what's going to make it actually sustainable for you and also make you a much, much better leader because you're going to be able to actually help the people along for the whole entire journey rather than just getting uh, distracted and sidetracked, um, which with the whole Facebook thing. Uh, I can understand, guys. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Well, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we heard three very inspiring stories. But before I go and ask the, the audience for, for questions, I, I just want to read out something else I wrote earlier, which I didn't mention earlier. And the question is, what makes a charismatic leader? Uh, keep up good eye contact. All three did that. Develop a genuine smile. All three did that. Have an open body posture. All three did that. <laughs> Keep your hands apart and away from your face when talking. All three did that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did it. I was watching. Be relaxed. All three of you relaxed. 
Uh, and then the important thing, and again, I think all three did this, is let people know they matter and you enjoy being around them and not when they talk. Again, all three did that. So I think we have three excellent proponents of <laughs> leadership and charismatic leadership. <laughs> Okay, so now it's down to the floor then. Let's have some questions. Let's start with you. You've, you've asked several already, I know, but let's go for it. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful introductions. They were very inspiring, and we are just at the beginning, so I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Um, I wanted to ask you, well, I'm a young woman myself, 20-something. Um, approaching 30, <laughs> and I have to decide for myself what I want to do, and I'm still pretty flexible, let's say, in terms of personal commitments and the place where I live, and in, within the last five years, I think I live in five countries, and I'm still willing to move farther, but I have a feeling that um, you might get into, get into a spiral where you, you become addicted to change at some point if you're still looking for what you want to do, and I wanted to ask you, the three of you, how important um, self-awareness is when you are growing as a leader or um, uh, when you're becoming mature, let's say, um, as, a, um, as an adult person. Because I think um, if you move, around, move a lot and you have a variety of exposures, it helps you get to know yourself better, of course. Um, but sometimes you need uh, input from um, external mentors or coaches or other leaders with more experience? And it, that would be my second question to you. Um, if you have come across such leaders, if you had your mentors. <laughs> I maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll divide the question maybe. Uh, uh, really good, good, insightful question, actually. So I'll start with the end, with the mentors. Um, I will say absolutely. You know, you'll find, sometimes you don't know that they're, they mentored you. you. You find people who actually care and people, your mentors are not going to tell you what you like to hear, and those are the real mentors, right? So I, I, I was fortunate along the way to have had mentors that maybe started sometimes by fighting with them because I didn't like what they were telling me. So don't, uh, don't uh, navigate towards people who tell you what you want to hear. They're not probably not your, your best mentors you have. So I, I think that that's really one. Uh, mentorship is extremely important. Um, I think you're at the age where you can be restless. It doesn't mean you're gonna be like that all your life. Your means you're still, for me, is you have to follow your heart. I always believe in that, right? I can't tell you sitting here today that I have a career plan or a map. You go from A to B to C, or I said, okay, in my career, this is what I wanna do. I never did, I can sit now and say, okay, this is what I've done. But I can tell you for sure, I always followed my heart. That means you know when you follow your heart, you know when it's time that that company is no longer for you or that job is no longer for you. And so that comes back to your, uh, to your first point, which is your self-awareness. Self-awareness is so important in both things. And for me, one is knowing yourself. As uh, my colleague said here, you, know, you have to know yourself. So that means listen, listen to yourself. You know, most of the time when we're unhappy, you know, we, we, we kind of don't want to hear it, right? Uh, and it's time to change, then you, you, you change. I think that's really important. Self-awareness is also important as a leader for other people. You, if you're not self-aware, you know, other people suffer. <laughs> you know? So that, that's a really good thing to have uh, in yourself. I don't know. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would just say uh, on the two parts of the question that, um, you're all here today because it's sort of like a Darwinian selection process. We're, you know, you're <laughs> swimming in a sea of amazing intellect, all right? So just think about that, all right? You are at the sort of normal end of the distribution. You're, you're up here, you know, in that. So there's no doubt that you're going to have many, many choices as to how you channel and apply your amazing intellect and your brains and your skills. Um, so it goes back to, uh, at some point, I think you do have to land on a couple of things. One is who you are, your values, and your hierarchy of needs when it comes to your values. And the second thing is your own pur purpose. So this notion of, you know, here's what's going to get me out of bed every day to wing into work, because by the way, you're going to be doing it for the next 50 years, <laughs> you know. Um, I think it's very important to have that. That's not the same as knowing what job you want to do 
or where you want to work or what sector you want to work in. So it's very, very important to, to, to spend time reflecting on that. The second thing is that as a manager or as a mentor, the greatest gift, or as a leader, the greatest gift you can give your people is the gift of feedback or the gift of helping them to get a much better understanding of who, who they are. There's this thing called the Johari window, which I love, which talks a little bit about what we know about ourselves um, and what other people know about ourselves. There's this whole space of what people see in us that we don't see ourselves. And I think that you know, knowing that is so important. I'll tell you one little story. In 1999, I was sitting in Hounslow. I'd been in the industry for two years, and my greatest ambition in 10 years' time was to become the UK medical director, because I thought that was going to be my career path. And a guy came into my office one day in 1999, and I, he, he had originally been the general manager of Bristol in the UK when I joined the company. And he knocked on my door and said, Annalisa, I'm now the head of international division for the company. We can't find a medical director in Australia. Um, would you be interested in it? Uh, we've searched around, we can't find anyone. And do you know what my response was? I said, but Tony, I'm only an associate director and that's an executive director's job. I just don't think I'm good enough for that yet. And he said to me, Annalisa, the only thing that's gonna hold you back in your career is you. Get on the plane and go and look at the job. And six weeks later, I was appointed as the executive medical director for Australia and New Zealand. And a year later, I became the vice president of the International Medical Division. And Tony Hooper, who's now the COO, chief operating officer at Amgen, has continued to be my mentor, my sponsor, and he gave me the greatest gift. It wasn't that he gave me the job. He gave me the feedback that really helped me think about you know, who I was and, and helped me to understand how other people saw me, which was clearly not the same as I saw myself at the time. So, so that's the importance, really, of knowing oneself. Sponsor a mentorship is important. We could talk a little bit later in the panel about the notion of sponsorship, which is becoming a very important topic um, in HR circles and you know, you know, people management circles. And this notion of making sure you have people that are following you through your career or that is sponsoring you to open doors for you that otherwise would stay closed. And I can talk a little bit more about that later, but it's actually important for men and women, but particularly the research now says that this is what women have lacked. Mm -hmm. And this is where women really need to focus their efforts now to ensure that they have a network of sponsors that are gonna help them grow and drive their professional careers. Maybe we can come back to that point later. So. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. What are you worried about by, like, you know, potentially ping-ponging about, you know, in your career? I mean, because, you know, one of the big trends, it used to be that, you know, you would get a job and, like, you would life for it, right? You know, you would be there forever. But, I mean, it's a really, really big trend these days for everybody to be around, you know, for a couple of years and then move on to another career. I mean, people say that, you know, on average you're going to have, what, five different careers. I mean, Annalisa is an excellent example of that. So, so what is your specific concern? Well, I'm, I'm not worried. I'm worried that I'm not worried. That's the point. Ah. <laughs> it's okay. It, it, that's okay. great then. <laughs> okay to change something. And I'm not afraid of changing my life and moving yeah. to a new field. And I'm worried that, well, I, th I think at some point you really need to realize um, where you want to specialize or where you want mm. to stay longer. But um, haven't listened to everything you, you have. All, all said so far, I'm like, well, perhaps I shouldn't be worried that I'm not worried and just follow um, you know, my gut. It's, it sounds like you're <laughs> built for for this world. I mean, it's exactly, the, I think I think the openness to being flexible like that is going to be critical. I mean, uh, the fact that you don't have any fear about doing what needs to be done or moving wherever you want to, you know, move to, to fulfill the career goals that you have is, is great. So, um, yeah. I, do, I do think, though, that... Um, I do, I, what I would say though is you have to be a little bit careful because as you get more and more senior, you actually have to put some runs on the board. So credibility mm -hmm. is important. So I do sometimes see, and I see this in my, my children actually, I have a, a daughter who's amazing and going to be an entrepreneur, but sometimes I say to her, you do actually have to land on something for more than three months, mm -hmm. you know, and that it would be good. <laughs> so I always say to people, two to three years, because you, you're able to go in 
uh, sort it out, make a difference, show people that you've made a difference, um, and then hopefully you'll be quick. then ready for the next thing. <laughs> yeah? Get out quick. Yeah, get out quick, whatever. But, you know, I think that's really important. So that we're talking about two concepts here. Brilliant that you're flexible, entrepreneurial, embracing lots of different things. But at some point in your career, you actually have to anchor in something. Uh, because as you get more senior, people are going to look at your CV. And the fact is, we're still old and stodgy at the top of these organizations, you know? So we, I do like to see people that have done very interesting things in their careers, but I also like to see people that have actually been hanging around long enough to see whether the decisions they made were disaster <laughs> or successful, <laughs> yeah? Because you do see people that manage to build their careers, and then suddenly they go like this. And actually, I think the warning signs were there a little bit earlier in their careers because they actually didn't hang around long enough to, for people to find out that some of the things they were doing um, were perhaps not the best things for the organisation. That's, so, that's a typical politician's career trajectory, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So. Yes, that's the problem with modern-day politics <laughs> exactly. and political cycles. Do you anyway, have any so more I, questions? You know. yeah, over here. In the um, hi, I want to uh, go back to the point where um, you said women can have it all, and that's great to hear, but I just was curious to learn what was your experience with juggling between different roles and sometimes were they conflicting to each other, and how do we go about managing them? Yeah, I think I had, um, we all have this experience, I think Annalisa said that I had one, when I had my first child or my second child, uh, a woman came to me who was the head of, um, of the R&D and said, you know, I think that's it for you. You know, definitely no third child, but with the second one, it's already going to, you're going to suffer in science, right? So for me, it's great because every time they tell me that, that gives me the energy to do even more, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think you, you, you make trade-offs. Right, life is about trade-offs, and you know what you you have to do. When I when I my kids were younger, you know, I still was completely in science, was completely active. You organize yourself um, in a certain way that you can do what you you need to do. But I was not, I was definitely not going to embrace a job where I'm going to travel too much because that was important for me to be there. There are other you can right now. There are daycares. There's all the stuff. My kids went to daycare, but I believed that. A happy mother is much better than a frustrated mother sitting in, in, in with, with her kids. So those kind of things you have to do with yourself. And you have to, uh, I will always say for the, the, the women, we suffer from two things. You know, one woman who said that, I, I always um, thank her for that, for the two Ps, as they call it, you know, perception and perfection. We want to be perfect. We can't be perfect. And it's okay. It's a trade-off. It's not about being perfect. And the perception is what people are going to think about me. I had my first child. I was in Germany. In Germany, there is a dogma. There is, a, there is an, an accepted thing in the society that when you have your child, you stay home. Otherwise, you're a bad mother. So I was the first one in the lab where people, when I, when I was expecting, will come to me and say, OK, so then when they were not even asking me if I was going to come back, Right? So they was absolutely accepted. When I say, no, 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 I'm coming back, somebody said to me they could not believe it, and I was like, uh, so everybody coming to me, but you have that strength, that knowing yourself, that I'm doing the right thing. I'm not a bad mother. I want to do this and this. I want to have it all. Um, but it, w it was hard, because um, at some point they came to me and said, your kids are going to be the experiment for us. <laughs> Because this was completely, you know, completely unheard of that a woman, and I had several friends, engineers and everything, you have your child, you stay home. So you have to not care about the perception as long as you know in your heart you're doing the right thing. So I, don't, I think, you know, so many years later, I do believe my kids are normal. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, uh, yes, everything is relative, right? <laughs> Get asked, are your kids normal? <laughs> well, you know, are we normal all? I don't know. But uh, so that, that, that's it. It's just believe in what you do in your heart. That's the right thing. Is if, and if you're not happy, nobody can. And the only thing is I'll leave you with is, um, you know, every time somebody tells you you can't, take it as energy to show the world that you can. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I would just say that, on, just on this topic, that um, 
I mean, we, and we get asked this all the time because it's very interesting because I think this is something that's so on the minds of this generation because the Gen Xs are very interesting. The research today in the US says that graduate women, um, over half of them have chosen not to have children. And when you ask them why, the, uh, there are many reasons. Obviously, a lot of it's financial, but the other one was really, you know, could I balance everything? You know, was it going to be fair, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I find that disturbing uh, because um, my view is that in this day and age, men and women, and remember this is to the men as well, okay, men and women should have the choice and there should be freedom of choice to have uh, and start a family and to be able to navigate that and manage that with your, your professional growth and development. And so for women to sort of feel that there was no choice and that, you know, there was no choice, I think is really not acceptable for modern day society. The other thing is that this group here, as I look out, is extremely diverse. And so it's not that, um, you know, can you have it all? The question is, what is all and how do you define that for yourself? And particularly in your societies that you live in, what does that look like? And then the challenges that you might face that are going to be very different depending on where you live. And Bahijo was talking about Germany. I've just spent you know, three, and three years working for a German company. And it's not that different today than it was when Bahija was studying in the lab. They haven't really that moved on that much. So the challenges that you might have to overcome, depending on where you live, will be different. But at the end of the day, I'm confident that all of you in the room today should have freedom of choice to be able to have a joy, the joys of starting a family. And you absolutely shouldn't worry about what your kids are going to turn out like. I mean, you know, that shouldn't be really on the agenda. The only tip I would give you is that if you have children or you choose to start children, don't apologize for having childcare or sending them to the nursery or whatever. I approach it like any good project. I always try and get people who know more about what I'm trying to do around me. I would have been an awful mother at home with young children. In fact, my kids tell me I was pretty awful at times to them when I was at home. Um, but I knew that if I hired professionals or I put them into environments where people who knew how to do the job well were, that the kids would get what they needed. Mm -hmm. And they did. So this, is, this goes back to norms, so history, and legacy. Contracting your kids. I right? love it. <laughs> and can I tell you, contracting out um, the, 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 the raising of my kids. I, I, sorry, I'm not, I probably can say this tomorrow, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not that. You don't subconscious. You know, it's this notion of. We do it in our professional lives. We go out and find people, you know, who can help us grow and learn in areas that perhaps we aren't so experienced in. I find it really odd how many women apologize when they're asked about how they've managed their childcare and they sort of hush and sort of say, well, actually, yeah, I had a nanny, you know? My entire post-tax earnings, my, my salary when my kids were young, entirely went to the care of my kids because I made that choice very early on. And, um, and it was a choice that, you know, I think was the right one for me at the time. Some women make different choices and we're not here to judge the choices that women make. But I think the point is you have a choice and that's really the most important mm -hmm. thing. Do you want to add anything, Adia? Um, I don't have exactly anything to add since I haven't had children yet, so I can't... It's obligatory. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I do want to come back real quick to the mentor question that you had, because I had one other thought on that, which is, um, you know, getting yourself, like, older, more experienced mentors, totally something that you should do, but I would say also balance it with having a community of peers as well, because there are some things that you're going to go through that, you know, other people that are more experienced or older just haven't because it is specific to the times. Um, so I would say, you know, just make sure that you get a balance of, you know, more experienced and then also peers. Okay, now in, in the interest of gender balance, do we have yes. any male yeah. questions? <laughs> yeah, right at that, yep. Yeah. There's one with microphone here. Yep. Oh, you had a microphone. Okay, you go, oh, then um, you second, okay. So may, may I speak your question now? Um, so uh, first of all, I wanted to thank the organizers for this amazing conference, and obviously the, the speakers as well for your amazing comments. Um, I had a question both to the chair and, and the speaker. So I, I just finished my PhD, and I'm now trying to set up a startup. 
And I actually expected it to be much more challenging to get support for my startup. But actually, I see the complete opposite. So strangers who become mentors, old friends who are willing to help me whilst doing my PhD to actually find the right collaborators or postdocs who are willing to invest time in the project was much more challenging. So, so I, I'm, I'm wondering whether you could comment on that on, on, uh, from, from both aspects. You can stop on that one. Um, well, I would say that you're probably going to, you're, you're in the beginning stages, right? So there's going to be different challenges that pop up, <laughs> promise. Um, so I would say, you know, in the beginnings for me, getting people to help me from the mentorship side of things was not very hard at all because everybody likes to help. I mean, is there anybody here that's going to raise their hand and say, I hate helping people? Like, so I mean, in terms of getting help, that's probably not the challenging part. The challenging part is one, finding really good co-founders. Um, because I mean, these are people that if it goes well, you're gonna be with for a minimum of three to five years. So how do you find somebody you can really, that you really connect with, that you can really communicate with, that you can resolve conflict with, that you're both on the same vision and the same page about where you wanna go? That is challenging. The other thing is, is that funding, funding is challenging. I mean, you know, I know that we kind of had the discussion of like, is there a funding gap? And I would say, you know, my experience in the US is gonna be different than your guys' experience here, but I mean, the very, very early, early stages of funding, I would say, is some of the hardest because, you know, there just isn't a lot of people, at least, you know, where I was at, that had the money to do that. Um, the other thing is, is that it's a big, huge leap of faith for people because in the beginnings, you have an idea and you have maybe, if you're lucky, a proof of concept. The rest of it is all, you know, faith in, in you as an individual. And so, you know, you have to be able to find people that are actually going to take that leap of faith and say, I believe that you can do it, not you have all of the evidence that shows that you have done it. Um, so, you know, that funding piece is definitely challenging. Um, and it just requires a ton of perseverance and determination to actually get it done. So um, I'm happy that it hasn't been so challenging for you yet. Um, and I would say be prepared for it to potentially be that way. Um, and, and make sure that it's something you're really passionate about because it's the only thing that will actually get you through it at the end of the day. By yeah. the way, we are looking for some co-founders as well. So. <laughs> oh, no and relentlessly promote. That's yeah. good too, I love it. <laughs> I think the only, yeah. So I think it's just amazingly wonderful when you know, young people uh, put themselves out in leadership roles to drive and start new companies. I mean, I think it makes me hopeful actually. Uh, for the sustainability of, 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 of you know, our, our, our countries and things. But, but I w what I would say is to remember you're a leader. So what do great leaders do? Great leaders have the vision. You know, they know where they want to get to, et cetera. But the only way they can do that is to surround themselves with great teams. And so your job, and it goes back to this, is you need to, so you need to decide what the makeup of that team needs to look like. And as a leader, I'm always, as I've said, looking for people who don't look like me, who don't think like me, and often are far brighter than I am, you know, and understand things that I couldn't possibly now start to understand. Uh, because that's, that's the idea of leadership. And I have to tell you, I think experience counts. So it goes, you know, you don't want to waste time stepping into potholes that you could have otherwise avoided. Because you want to channel your, channel your energies on the good stuff. You don't want to constantly be, you know. And so I do think you need a mix. You need a mix of the entrepreneurial, innovative, creative thinkers. But at some point, you need one or two people that have been there, seen it, done it, got the t-shirt and all the bruises to match. Because I think that experience counts for a lot. And the other thing is that the people who are really, really experienced, you're just going to be like a sponge and learn from them. And the quicker you can get up that learning curve, it's always a balance. But um, I would say to you, uh, make sure you have one or two people that are actually also quite recognized because the ability to get money, a lot of it's about trust, and use them as the people you know, who are gonna be able to attract investment because they've got a name and people will trust them. Um, I think that's, uh, that will help you uh, sustain your, uh, your, your funding if you have a good idea. So experience doesn't mean somebody who's going to always tell you we've done that, but it didn't no. work. Because <laughs> no, that skills innovation sometimes, no. right? No. And sometimes we do it. Yeah. 
Maybe I can add something since you are specifically the chairman. You know, I've been involved in establishing 11 startup companies, and I'll tell you one story. At the early stage, which is where you are now, it's very it's fun, it's exciting, but when you accept money, you've got to look at the terms that you get that money under, believe me. Uh, my first one, which was established in 1986, uh, we took a bank loan initially, 150000 at 8 p.m. on a Sunday evening, I had my CEO on the phone in tears, right? Because the bank were about to foreclose at 9 a.m. on the Monday morning, right? And they would have taken my house. My house was on the line, and it was down to that sort of issue. I mean, and actually, if I look at that company since then, because it survived that scrape, and my house is no longer on the line, you'll be pleased to know, uh, the, uh, the company's last valuation I looked at is 800 million. So, you know, you can do it, but it, it can be a bit harrowing. And you do get grey hair in the process, believe me. So. But, you know, that's a really good example of how you don't need to have them on your board or whatever, but I love the notion of advisors. It goes back to what was said here. We, um, I think as you get older, the greatest joy of our professional lives, certainly for me, is to be able to pay it forward and mentor and help the next generation. I can't, to be honest, you know, I can't think of anything better in my professional life today than to hire great people, build great teams, and then be on my job to mentor and support the next generation. And I know many, many of my peers who would say the same. So don't underestimate that. And the concept of a, an advisory board or a group that you can go to, I think is just as powerful in many ways than your official legal yeah, do you think board. it's a special issue for female entrepreneurs as opposed to male? Yes. But, you know, I, th I, I actually believe you on yes. that as well. Yes. I'm in the process of mentoring a lady who's actually Palestinian origin, but working in Jordan. And when she first came to me in 19, uh, uh, 2006, the company she'd established, she had a whole bunch of university people on it that knew nothing about anything as far as I could work out. Uh, she had three products which were Me Too's, rest of the world. You know, here you'll have 60,000 in their catalogue. She had three. And I said, it's not going to work. You know, it's just it's going to fail. And we turned it around. And that company now has a significant operation in the United States. It has major operations in the Middle East. And we're about to launch in the Far East now as well. And the issue with her is that, and it's a female, I should say, female CEO in an Arab country, not an easy combination. Uh, the issue with her is her husband was very traditional. That she had four young kids and he wanted to stay at home and forget all this nonsense about science and whatever. But we managed to turn him round as well. And she now, I think, is probably one of the lead Arab female entrepreneurs in the country. So, it, it, and it, it can be done. It can be Women done. find it far it's more difficult to ask for help. And women are far less effective at creating these virtual networks. Now, that's the research on our generation, and I think, you know, perhaps a little bit younger. Perhaps you guys are so networked and everything else. But I think women, in some ways, view it as a, a sign of failure or a weakness to have to be able to go out and ask for advice. Or the other thing is that women often tell us in the research is that they're worried that people aren't going to say yes. <laughs> Or, you know, so I think that we've all, we're, we're very, very good at being self-sufficient. And again, I, I'm a little bit, I'm always a little bit worried about giving my own experiences because I come from a different generation. But, and I think it is changing. But I think to the women here, just guard against that a little bit. You shouldn't feel like that. That women, you know, we need networks. We need to have advisors. And we need to go out and put ourselves on the line confident that other people are going to want to help you. Yeah, I mean, that's the main that's thing. The process. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very good. And, and I was conscious that's... right at the back. Yeah, that's it. You with the big hands. <laughs> Hi. So uh, we've heard a lot about the importance of mentorship. Uh, I was wondering if I could turn it around and ask the panel, uh, what do you look for in a mentee? I mean, probably a lot of people ask you for advice all the time. And so how do you choose, I want to spend my time with this person? Uh, maybe if, if you had an example of the, the best mentee of your life, uh, you know, if you could speak to that. So. Yeah, um, am I? Yeah, yeah. Um, I established a one uh, official mentorship, you know, uh, in the company where I am, and the mentee. Uh, the, it says a lot about the mentee. First of all, because we just say, okay, we we select some that are you can you can you you know that uh, they will benefit from that some young stars some you know upcoming or others and then you observe actually the mentees 
you know, um, you, you asked us about the, uh, the redefinition of entrepreneurs, you know, so s some of the mentees, they were not the first obstacle of not finding a time and they're, they're gonna, you know, leave it alone. They're not gonna be so at your door all the time, wanting to have that time. And then when you meet with them, so it says a lot. So the mentee, if you wanna be mentored, it is your time. Somebody's saying, I have, I'm giving you the time, use it. And don't give up. This is all about, again, entrepreneurship and everything. One definition for me is, is you know, you, you just, you push back. Um, and even when we sit here in the panel and tell you what you should do, push us back as well. Mm -hmm. As I was telling some, some uh, people, in, uh, uh, there are a lot of dogmas because we live in the present and maybe a little bit in the past. I feel like a dinosaur today. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you know, you're, you're the generation of Facebook. You're gonna, you are inventing the future. So your future is gonna be very different. Who's going to push the panel back? That's what I want yeah. to know. Come on, there's, there's an invitation there. If you are, uh, I, have, I have one more thing to add okay. regarding the whole how you choose the mentee side of things. Um, it really is about who actually comes back and does the work. I mean, really, most of the time, we will make time if you actually ask for it. But I have a lot of people that come, and they'll have like one meeting, and then they never follow up. Yeah. And it's... It's all in your court. If you come back and you just keep on being persistent, like they'll make the time to help you. Um, you may have to wait a little bit and like schedule it out, but like they'll make the time. Come on, push them now. <laughs> Hi, Andrew Herr from the U.S. So I'll push back. There's been a lot of discussion about the needs of women, um, but as there are more women entering leadership, and as there's a push to do that. From your perspective, what are the needs of young men to communicate with women? Because we communicate differently, right? So we're going to need help to communicate with female leaders, just as young women need help communicating with today's male leaders. Yep. So I'd push back for the different perspective there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a question about diversity. Um, and uh, actually, for many years in my career, I really didn't want to talk about the topic because, you know, when a woman who's rising up through the ranks starts to pontificate about diversity, the only reaction, certainly as I've been coming up through, is, well, she would say that, wouldn't she? Um, it's sort of like a self-serving agenda. Um, now I don't care, because I'm that age, you know, so I talk about it a lot. And I've been doing a lot of work to look at this from an evidence base as well. So the question is about diversity. So I think that increasingly what you're seeing is that this link between diversity and business outcome. So you're starting to see the dialogue change um, in the senior at the senior tables, particularly in the early adopters of this sort of notion that certainly in healthcare, it is completely stupid to think that if you have a whole sort of, I'm just going to use a, a term that some people won't like, but you know, if, if it's sort of like the pale male 50, you know, European or US board, to think that that group is going to be able to sustain long-term value and growth creation over time better than you know, a truly diverse, highly functioning team that reflects the nature of the customer base, yeah? um, uh, the, from a geographic point of view, from a gender point of view. Uh, intellectually, I don't get that. It's not to say that the, 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 the guys are bad. I mean, individually, all brilliant. It's just that we all know that innovation and growth and value creation comes from different perspectives and creative ideas and the ability of teams to come together. So if you then believe that, then of course the dialogue around gender becomes very different. Because what it says is that we fundamentally believe that certainly in the global talent pool we want every voice to be heard and we want every voice to have a potential to contribute at all these different tables. And therefore, it's actually less about the state of diversity and I call that the bums on seats analysis. You know, how many men, how many women, how many this, that, the other. It's actually then more about diversity as a capability, which is your question. And it's about how do we teach the next generation to unlock the potential of diversity? Because it's not easy, actually. If you put three men, three women, three Chinese, three Latin Americans, three, yeah, in the, the French, you know, add in a few others, it's actually very difficult as a leader. It's much more difficult to lead that team in a consistent way to unlock value. And add in 
you know, the fact you're trying to do it over teleconferences and web WebExes, and despite Cisco's promises, the video conference always goes down when the important question is being asked. You know, it's that sort of thing. So I think that it goes back to uh, what we were saying earlier, which is it's about leadership, actually. It's about these soft skills. It's about how do you interrelate? How do you see other people? Do you look at the person that's sitting next to you and view them as a, a threat or a competitor? Or do you view them as somebody you can learn from, that you can ask a question like, what do you think, and learn from that? So these are all skill sets that I actually think you guys are going to be thinking a lot more about than we were asked to think about coming up through our careers. And we just sort of had to learn it along the way, really. Yeah. Um, I would say that, you know, when I look at this young generation of males, I would say that the thing that I see more in your guys' cohort than I've seen from interacting with people that are older than us is uh, a more acceptance of being able to be vulnerable. Um, I would say that there's this whole new generation of, of leaders that are really tapping into the squishy bits because really like that's what actually motivates a lot of our generation is like how do I nurture my soul throughout my career rather than how do I just have a career and like make the money so that way I can do nurturing the soul after my job. And so I would say that you know you're, you already are getting a lot of the skills that I think you need to be successful and if you're just comfortable with those squishy bits um, I, I, I think that that's, I think it's, I really think it's half the battle. I'm really serious. I mean, the I squishy that. bits are, are what make, are, are what make the inner, the interactions between people really human. And, it, and it's what, and it's what allows you to really see what is motivating for that person and what they're passionate about and what they're scared of. Because especially in a startup, you're going to be confronted with a ton of stuff that scares you to death and you have to be okay with admitting to your co-founders like I'm scared of this and I need help working through it rather than just like oh I'm fine and then you get into the investor like meeting and then you totally like crash down mm -hmm. uh, it, it's that willingness to be really really vulnerable and honest about where you're at and be okay with other people doing that with you without getting freaked out about it I noticed this morning a number of questions coming from the audience about CSR, corporate social responsibility, concerns about how to give back in low and middle income countries and things. 20 years ago in the industry, certainly if we were sitting in a group, if, if anyone mentioned corporate social responsibility, you'd get shot. You know, because um, in the 90s, it was a very different culture. Um, I love, I don't know about you, I love the fact <laughs> that the next generation is coming through and doing things like asking about work-life balance. The men are asking to take time off from a That's fantastic. That's going to really revolutionize the lives of women in the workplace. You want flexible working. You want home working. You want to have more of a purpose in your professional lives. This is all really, really good stuff. It doesn't detract from the fact you've got to deliver. <laughs> you've got to actually do some... You know, you've got to deliver on your day job. But I just think that this is going to drive... I don't know if you've noticed this in your company, but certainly in my previous companies, you know, the dialogue is changing because people are realizing at the top that the work environment is going to have to change to be able to engage, energize, and retain the next generation of talent in the workplace. Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. In absolutely. One or two more right over the side, that's it, on the side there. Have you got a microphone for oh, it? Me? Oh, up there. You can yell, that's okay. Uh, Harriet Fear from One Nucleus. Um, I see a lot of, and I spend quite a lot of time talking with young PhDs and postdocs, and it's just an observation really. I would say the, the most significant difference between young men and young women looking for what their next career step is going to be, whether it's forming a company or whether it's just getting out of the lab and doing something different, is that the majority of women say, I'm scared of that, I don't think I could do this. And when I mention particular jobs to them, they almost automatically put up barriers. The guys are like, wow, what a brilliant opportunity. And so what I say to the women is actually, by putting up the barriers, what you're doing immediately is deselecting yourself. You're deselecting yourself right from the get-go. And that always resonates with them. You can see the mindset wearing. And I've had a number of people come back to me and say, you know what, that gave me the power and the confidence to go back and have a go. Because actually, if you don't have a go, well, you've got to be in it to win it, haven't you? Mm. Well, any comments? Yeah. 
comment on that? No, I feel bad for any guy who wants to ask a question because we made this panel become a little bit men and women, so, but more of the entrepreneur as well. <laughs> Hi there, Harsh from uh, University of Edinburgh. Um, so I wanted to ask you guys, uh, as leaders of today, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the leaders of tomorrow in this room? And uh, as a second question, um, this is based on my observation, more or less. Um, so I'm doing a PhD, and what I see that uh, in my uni, there's a lot of help and support out there to help people develop soft skills or leadership skills. but there's a big issue there, which is they're not good at inspiring uh, or bringing out enthusiasm in people to go out of the comfort zone and learn the skills. And people get bogged down into the research. Um, so how do you think we can kind of overcome this issue? really my first lessons of leadership was my mother, right? And so I, I think that's, uh, that's really important. I think the challenges for the, for the future is, is the pace. It's going really fast, but this is exciting at the same time. And we cannot possibly think of what the challenges you're gonna face in the future, nor should you be thinking about them, frankly, because, at least to me, because that's some barriers we put to say why we should not do something or try to, if you had asked me when I was maybe in Morocco, whatever, you know, to get to, even on, on the plane and go somewhere, it would have been scary like that, right? But then you get the motivation. So that would be my, my, my thing. I would not even want to stop to think of all your challenges other than it's the challenge of everybody's, everything, the amount of data that's out there and everything, but that's also opportunity. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I, I believe that, you know, obviously, we're dealing in this increasingly, it's sort of volatile, unpredictable, risky, and it's all because it's moving so fast and, and because, you know, globalization, all these other things that are going on. Um, so get used to ambiguity, get used to uh, having to change direction. Um, and it comes back again to this, it's all about culture and leadership. I mean, you have to though, again, you know, it's really important to focus on what you love to do and to get really good at doing it. You need a technical skill. You know, you can't learn leadership in a classroom. Leadership, I'm completely convinced, and actually this nature and nurture thing, you know, yeah, nature gives you a personality to a certain extent, I guess, you know, sort of to a certain extent. But I'm completely convinced it's about this whole evolution. It's, it's all about nurture. It's all about the experiences you grab along the way. You have to anchor yourself in some technical skills and abilities. I mean, you really do. But I think the message from today's panel is it's not all about technical skills, about management, about process. A huge part of it is about this other piece that we think is going to be the key to you accelerating your ability to unlock future growth and value, because that's what innovation is all about in the future. And I think that if I was asked, I get asked a lot actually, what do you wish you would have known when you were in your 20s that you know now? And it's this bit, it's this bit. I wish people, and I, in some ways I was lucky because I was in the military and I was learning stuff along the way, but you know, I said to my kids, you know, don't follow the norm. When all your friends are going off to do their semester abroad in Spain because they want to live in Barcelona for seven months, I said to my son, go to Cape Town and hang out in the townships because that's actually what you want to do. You want to go and work in Africa and development. And he's like, well, yeah, but all my friends are going off and everyone expects me to do that. No, challenge that and go off and do something different. And I'm completely convinced that getting that mindset in your 20s will stand you in really good stead, whatever you decide to do as you move forward. Um, in terms of, you know, I think that the biggest challenge is actually um, getting at that self-knowledge piece. Because, you know, a lot of times you're asked when you're a kid, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you kind of, you know, take a shot in the dark and you're like, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a whatever. 
And I don't think that anybody actually walks you through the process of really critically examining who you are and what you want to be in the world and how you want to contribute to the world. Because if you actually know the answers to those questions, then your choices about what you're going to do with your life, they're a lot clearer. They're not necessarily easier. But I think that that is a massive challenge. And especially given that our generation really demands a work life balance that is very fulfilling in both the work and the, and the life side of things. If you don't know what you're really, really passionate about, then it's going to be really, really hard to be fulfilled in that work environment. So I would say the self-knowledge piece is really, really critical. And, and having some educational process that actually helps guide you through that process, even in like high school, that would be excellent. Um, so that way you can actually make a lot of the choices that you're going to be making. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know how people, I, I don't even know how I made the decision about what college I was going to go to and what major I was going to have, given that I didn't have that information early on. I was very fortunate in that I got a lot of that information early-ish on in college, but um, I don't know. If I didn't have that information now, I don't know how I would be doing what I'm doing today. Well, I mean, sadly, we're going to have to call it a day there. I, some of the speakers are going to be around over coffee. Maybe you can talk to them individually then. But let, let me just round off on what I think we've said so far on the panel. Uh, firstly, it's do what you believe in. And I think that's a most, probably the most critical thing along. You know, get something which you're really passionate about and go for it. It's what I call all the, all the Ps. Passion, first of all. Uh, you need some sort of plan, some sort of trajectory which you're going to work to if you can. Uh, you need the right people to assist you. Uh, you need perseverance because things don't always go to plan. And finally, you have to put up with a bit of pain as well. And believe me, I can tell you that. So uh, the other issue which I think came up is mentorship. And I think Ash applies to both male and female. Having someone to guide you through the minefields of some of these ventures is worthwhile, well and truly. But I think especially for females, actually. I think I agree with that, that comment there. And really, leadership is all about the soft issue. It's the non-quantifiable as I don't know, like squishy bits. It's the squishy bits. Bits. So with that last comment, I'll say thank you very much to all the, or the audience for the questions and to the speakers as well. So, yeah. Good. Thank you.